In this course, we won't have time to examine so-called phase diagrams in detail. But in discussing gases, we've had a chance to at least discuss vapor-liquid coexistence curves and critical temperatures. And in one of the very first lectures, I mentioned the widespread use of supercritical carbon dioxide in the dry cleaning industry as a green alternative to chlorocarbon solvents that used to be used. So, in this demonstration, I'd like to illustrate properties of carbon dioxide, some of which are relevant to our discussion of gas and liquid properties. To begin, let's add some dry ice to this plastic bottle. If we now seal the bottle tightly and warm it a bit, the dry ice will sublime, increasing the amount of gaseous CO2 and, given the fixed volume, also increasing the pressure. As the pressure grows, we eventually come to the point where some of the gas liquefies. At this stage, we have solid, liquid, and gaseous CO2 all in equilibrium with one another. And this is called the triple point because all three phases are present simultaneously. It occurs at a precise temperature and pressure, neither of which is particularly extreme for CO2, about five atmospheres pressure and a temperature of minus 56.6 degrees Celsius. Can you see the liquid and solid phases? And of course, we can't see the gas, but it is there in the apparent void volume. In the next demonstration, I'd like to illustrate the critical temperature for CO2, which you recall is the temperature beyond which the gas cannot be compressed to a liquid at any pressure. And indeed, we stop calling the substance a gas and call it a supercritical fluid. For CO2, the critical point occurs at about 73 atmospheres and 31.1 degrees Celsius. So here, I have a sealed tube containing carbon dioxide at high pressure. As room temperature is a bit below 31.1 degrees Celsius, there's clearly a liquid phase, and you can see that by observation of the meniscus, that is, the boundary between the liquid and the gaseous phases that we see more clearly because of the change in index of refraction across the phase boundary. Now let's gently heat the tube with this economical substitute for a heat gun namely a hair dryer. Keep an eye on the meniscus. Do you see how it's starting to disappear? As I warm the tube past the critical temperature, the carbon dioxide becomes supercritical and I can no longer discern two phases. Now, an interesting thing about the critical point is that as it is approached from above in temperature, one often observes a phenomenon known as opalescence. The condensation of gas to liquid that occurs everywhere in the tube leads to very small suspended drops that scatter light beautifully until a new liquid phase is formed. So let's watch carefully as the tube cools. There, do you see the opalescence beginning? And as it fades, do you see the liquid phase increasing in volume and the meniscus rising up the tube? As supercritical fluids go, carbon dioxide is relatively easy to work with because the pressures and temperatures involved are not especially extreme. And the characteristics of CO2 as a solvent are useful for a surprising number of things. In addition to dry cleaning, supercritical CO2 extraction is now one of the two most widely used methods to decaffeinate coffee and tea. Indeed, Numi Tea Company calls its supercritical carbon dioxide process an organic use of effervescence and further calls the process chemical-free. Such chemophobia can only make one shake one's head, but now you've seen a supercritical fluid for yourself and we'll look more at critical constants in the lectures.